So as I said, my name is Craig. I'm from the Axie Futures team. And just take a moment to check out this disclaimer. This you know, covers the usual that this is not financial advice. This is for educational purposes. And yeah, if we do get disconnected, just while you're reading that, if we, if, you could do, if we do get disconnected for any reason, just keep an eye on your inbox. I will send a link to rejoin in case that happens. It's only happened once before, but if it does, that's what we can do. All right, so as I said, today's session is covering the fastest path to consistency. We're going to look at the order flow strategies to fast track your consistency. The truth about making $500 a day, this is something that, you know, we sometimes get questions about. Is that possible? Especially people who are just starting out, they want to know, is this a viable uh, goal to have in mind? Rich will be covering that. We'll be looking at some equity curves of traders who trade on the Axia Futures floors. So we've got floors in London, Poland, Cyprus. We're telling you about that in a second. And you'll hear about the ultimate skill you actually need to master, uh, in our opinion, for consistent trading. And we'll be also looking at how this applies using the Bookmap Market Pulse tool. So Bruce will be covering that. And today's session is going to be led by Richard Bailey, our head of training here at Axie Futures. Now, Richard, part of what we're going to be looking at today is the reversal in uh, CPI data. So Richard's going to be showing that. Uh, then Bruce is going to be covering a reversal in the NFP data. And then next week, Richard's going to be showing you how he executed a reversal, also on some data. And in that session, if you wanted to sign up for that, just go to leadtradeworkshop.com forward slash S&P 500. What I'm going to do is share the link in the chat just so you have that. That will take you to a Zoom registration page if you want to join for next week's session, which will also be on Thursday. So that's what we'll be covering there. It's actually showing the execution of how to enter and basically why the S&P has been a buy on so many data points. So Rich is going to be breaking that down for you and then showing you the execution behind that. So to start off, I'm going to bring uh, Alex Hayward on. So Alex is our co-founder at Axie Futures, and he helped launch the our London floor, which you know, you've seen some pictures here. Our London floor is our head office. We host a lot of events here. We've got some of our biggest traders who are housed here at our London office. We often host workshops with experts from various uh, corners of the world. Uh, we've got our, our Polish office, We've also got some great traders here. And recently, Alex helped kick off our Cyprus office, which is really exciting. We've got, as you can see, quite a beautiful scenic area there. Loads of traders joining the desks there. So if Alex wants to tell you a little bit about that, I'm sure he will. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring Alex on to kick things off. He's going to introduce Bruce and Richard and really set the stage for today's session. So Alex, are you there with us? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Craig, and a uh, pleasure to be here, pleasure to, uh, to, to welcome especially the Bookmap uh, community. This is our very first event. I actually met the founder back in 2000, the founder of uh, uh, Bookmap back in 2016. We tried to do a project. It's been a long time. Uh, it, it didn't quite work out at that stage. So it's you know been five six years uh, onwards. I met up with him in Milan. We've got a couple of traders in our uh, in a little satellite uh, uh, office. So some of our biggest uh, uh, German bond traders and uh, Austrian gold and oil uh, in in the office. And met up with um, uh, with the founder there. I'm super excited for this event today. We have uh, a lot of you know uh, content to share. A lot of uh, enriching you know knowledge. We're always I'm here in the Cyprus office at the end. We've got time in the q and A. I'll be happy. We've actually bought a, 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 a some land and, and an old house that we've converted to trading floors. Uh, so I'll kind of walk out the room, you know, converting this room. Uh, we've got two trading floors on either side of our uh, outdoor uh, training center. And uh, the guy's been working on uh, for the Bank Japan wage numbers uh, that are coming out uh, uh, tomorrow, specifically from one of the biggest trade unions or the biggest trade union in Japan. So a couple of guys are speaking about tactics, uh, what time they're going to be coming in, uh, because that will be the pre precursor for uh for the for the really big event next week if bank of japan will move their rates in 17 years so anyway, without further ado um i uh, also want to mention our you know resident guru you know uh, probably one of the post, uh, top futures traders the uh, in my circles the top futures trader on the planet he's responsible for developing you know all of our junior talent that uh, gets housed on our desks in our various locations uh that then get backed by uh, by the company um, uh, Richard Bailey. So he's always, it's always something, you know, deep to learn. And then very excited uh, to have, uh, so that's Richard right there, uh, who, who uh, we'll have a, a nice deep session with. And then Bruce uh, Pringle, uh, uh, we've got to know him uh, quite a bit over the last month. 
and uh, excited he's shown up some you know amazing technology on the visualizations uh you know and, and we have a couple of our traders using uh the uh using the book map uh, tool and uh, we've just seen a lot of uh, evolution in the space last 20 years i've been involved in the market since 2004 uh, i've been building teams across europe since around 2007 i'm currently building a new team here in cyprus we've got approximately 12 uh approximately 12 13 uh, traders now we're at the moment building an outdoor gym, our outdoor uh, sauna and cold plunge pool. So the traders have a, a very kind of holistic, you know, uh, setting because we sit many hours, focus a lot of hours. And so just have those physiology flashes. So our decision making doesn't become uh, too jaded. You know, always, you know, you just have to tilt in a five minute period. You can throw away your entire day, your entire week. Uh, so super excited to have uh, Bruce uh, here with me showing uh, a, a really exciting tool and uh, and, and enlightening uh, that auditory sense that disappeared when the market went from the pit into electronic trading and the market pulse tool. Uh, and, and regarding that market pulse, it's just bringing you alive, you know, almost that velocity, that energy of the market, and bringing that to your attention. We love to use that uh, on specifically our momentum breakout uh, trades. So, I'm going to um, share my screen. I've got a couple of quick questions uh, before we head over to the main teaching. So if you are um, if you're ready for a couple of quick questions, let me just uh, share my screen for you there. OK, give me a thumbs up or a yes in the chat, uh, potentially, if you can see my screen. Just let me know if you can see it. OK, I know Craig. Thank you, John. I know Craig uh, uh, has already asked this question, but it'll be great. Just quick enough, if you can scan with your iPhone or with your uh, or with your Google uh, phone, Apple or Google or whichever phone you have, you can scan that QR code or you can go if you're on your desktop, go to slido.com and then hashtag bookmap. OK, slido.com hashtag bookma uh, bookmap and just which city are you from? Uh, I know a whole bunch, but it'll just be nice for all of you to see from each other in a bird's eye view. This will populate nicely to see. So we have uh, Miami, Los Angeles, Toronto. So we're all stateside, both east and west coast. Uh, Beverly, Massachusetts, uh, Brussels. Uh, so from Toronto. So we have most, uh, the majority of people here are from the Toronto side at the moment. Uh, the Carmel, Indiana, uh, Netherlands. Okay, so Tokyo. Uh, so we'll be trading. So any, if you're trading tomorrow morning, um, if, if, if you if you are in Tokyo, we are trading the Japanese markets tomorrow. We'll be trading the Nikkei futures. We'll be trading the JBL, which is the Japanese 10-year futures uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll also be trading um, uh, the Japanese yen uh, uh, futures leading into the important uh, uh, the important Bank Japan event. Seattle, uh, I've got some of my favorite bands from there, Texas, Fort Myers, um, uh, Rome, Roma, uh, and New York. So welcome everyone and great to see uh, that uh, that spread. So it looks like the, the majority, uh, the heavyweights, Toronto, Chicago, and Seattle, and we have the Europeans from the Czech Republic and Germany. Okay, so I wanna start off with this. And I'm going to be about five months. What does being a consistent trader mean to you? You know, the whole topic today is, is, is busting some myths. And Richard's going to be showing you some fascinating equity curves. I'm going to be showing you some equity curves, how the traders traded on the last non-farm payrolls, uh, where uh, Bruce will be showing a market, uh, you know, uh, uh, how you can utilize the market pulse and some of the reversal patterns that we'll be speaking to you, not in today's workshop, but also next week's workshop. Uh, so what does being a consistent trader mean to you? So I'll just give you, uh, we'll spend about you know a minute and a half on the slide. Just give you that time because when you frame leading into a workshop, a training workshop, it kind of sets the, uh, it sets your learning intention and, and, uh, and, and your potential uh, blind spots or potentially you're on the right, the right way. And Richard's going to be exploring uh, equity curves, understanding what that looks like. So, Consistent risk management, okay, uh, you know, risk reward position sizing. Our very top traders, you know, that's a great one. Our very top traders uh, might have only a win rate of around 20, 20% to 30%, but their sizing on the trades that they have conviction, they, may re uh, they, they have a win rate of 95 to 
Okay, well, never quite 100%, you know, but, but, uh, but in the high 80% and up. So profit management, who can control his emotions? You know, so all, all of these aspects are, you know, what's, you know, consistently to follow your plan, process orientated, not be hijacked by, by uh, you know, by the PNL. One of the aspects before we put traders live after our career program, traders who are on our 12-month blueprint uh, coaching program, before we put any live, they had to be able to have this powerful learning system in place. Okay, so we've got quite a few people say, follow the plan, follow the plan, uh, control the drawdown. So it seems most of the responses here are about plans and risk management, consistent in the risk management. I'm doing some exciting work uh, with a gentleman who, who does creativity training with the U.S. Special Forces, and he speaks about the times when you, you have good risk management in, 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 uh, in play, you have good plans in play, but knowing the moment and the time when it's in a game of nonlinearity, applying linear rules, knowing when the odd time it's right to bend the rules. Okay, and we, uh, I speak about that on, a, on an entire separate uh, protocol actually during our 12 month coaching program. Average profit, is that a goal or high? Preservation of capital before capital accumulation. So, you know, and I thank you for engaging and uh, because it, it just gives perspective. This is like the hive mind, seeing people's different perspectives uh, with the gods. And so plan is at the forefront. So I'm gonna go to the next question. A question that Richard kind of probed to all of us just before you know the webinar, and and I think he'll tackle this at the uh, on his view at the end of uh, today's uh, session in the Q and A. But where will the S and P five hundred be by the end of the year? Okay, so let's see. So we have so far this uh, above uh, above seven thousand below. So below five thousand is the lead at the moment. So it sounds like I'm at the horse races at the moment. And now we have between six thousand seven thousand uh, in the lead. So between six to seven thousand. So I've probably got a couple of people have some call options uh, on on those strikes for the 2024 year. So majority think no one uh, where uh, no one. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Mark Stockton says, so below 5,000, only 32%, but over 60% thinks it'll be higher than where it is at the moment. Okay, so, uh, and Richard's going to give his view on that right at the end of uh, today. So we've got between uh, six to 7,000 of where people uh, in this group anticipate it. Okay, so we just had US CPI inflation happen on Tuesday. Okay, on Tuesday. Now, I want to ask you, which products did our traders trade the most over the recent US CPI inflation report on Tuesday? Now, I try not to look at the graph. I thought the graph would actually come up afterwards, but it's come up beforehand. So try not cheat. Uh, 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 try not cheat on this. Uh, but let's just see what people think. Uh, it'll be interesting from your perspective, which markets you trade. Uh, so which products did our traders? And so what we're going to show you in next week's webinar, uh, those of you, uh, Craig shared the link in the chat. At next week's webinar, uh, we'll also show you where our, which products our traders made the most money in and which products we lost in. Okay, so that'll be in next week's webinar. And we're explaining, uh, you know, the, the tactics and the strategy. So from that response, we have a uh, majority saying the ES and then the NASDAQ. So you're completely correct. Okay, uh, you're, uh, we've got uh, Dettier, Plant, uh, Telecom. Uh, that's uh, South Africa, uh, Dettier. Um, so E-mini 500, and I'll tell you, it'll surprise you massively next week which product we make the most money in, because it certainly wasn't in the top three products that we traded. Okay, so just leaving. So the most money we made, we made in the US CPI was not in the ES or the NASDAQ or the German Bunds or gold. Okay, so uh, something that we'll share with you next week. So I think I've got one or two more questions. This is a, a trader is actually uh, from the US, from your neck of the woods, uh, Bruce, uh, East Coast. And uh, he's in uh, the Cypress office. He's just gone live this week. He's, uh, he's one of our, I, I call him Mr. S uh, Mr. Samurai because he's our Bank of Japan specialist. Uh, so he's just gone live just this past week. He's been... Um, uh, on the simulator for an X period of time. And I'm going to be revealing that in a moment. How many months should you be on the simulator before you go live? So we have six over here. We have three, we have one, we have two. We have 12. Okay, 
uh, until you have consistency. So, so great. So there's some qualitative uh, uh, observations here. Yeah, we don't put anyone live unless they have edge, unless they have a learning protocol, learning system to debrief themselves from their losses, how they amplify their winners. And uh, so, but the average on our desk, the average on our, uh, on our desk is best case scenario, four months, but the average is between nine to around 13 months. Okay, the average time it takes to put a trader live on our desk. So I just hope that gives you uh, uh, that gives you a bit of a perspective. Okay, so now just to get a feel for who we have in the room over here, are you currently trading a live or a simulated account? Okay, so at the moment, so let's just see a, a, a few people accumulating over here. So pretty much. 50-50 uh, between live and simulator. Okay, I know to here you say you live. Um, so we, we, have, we have a good mix over here. Okay, so those of you who trade live, those who trade, you know, on the simulator, we've got some, you know, really great examples of where the active traders uh, past week or Richard will be sharing and, uh, and, and, and the perspective of what we, uh, what we mean from consistency. So without further ado, I think that was my, uh, my last question. Thank you for participating. Um, the, so where do you, so sorry, Cool Beans, you participate by, uh, by um, scanning the QR code. Uh, we finished now uh, with the poll, but thank you for participating. I'm gonna hand it over to Richard. And uh, and thank you for uh, for uh, for being here, and I look very forward uh, to seeing uh, you all back uh, when I when I come back on the Q and A sessions at the end. I'll hand it over to Richard, who's now currently in London, and he heads our uh, training and development for our traders out there. Thank you very much. Um, right, brilliant. Love to be lovely to be here. So um, good to see all of your answers. I'll touch on the where I think the S and P is going to go towards the end of the session. Um, <clears throat> And give you my reasoning for that as well. So I'll touch on that. Obviously, though, predicting with the future isn't necessarily what you really want to be doing. And certainly from a day trading perspective, as you will see in a moment, most trading is reasonably short term. So let's get on with it. I will share my screen. Let me reclaim host. Okay, here we go. Right. You should now be able to share my screen. And as I said, and that's the whole purpose of this is to explain what is consistency. Thanks for some of the answers. One thing that I didn't notice anybody say, and a lot of it lent towards risk management, having a plan, executing a plan. What nobody did point out was the idea of effectively shooting for big winners. Um, and that's one of the key features. We take the, um, the guy who's just gone live that Alex just mentioned. One of his big... Um, attributes is his ability to control his downside but then also shoot for the big winners and i explain this in a little bit more detail in a moment so what is consistency unfortunately what most people think consistency is and actually i would give credit to most of you guys it's not about earning a consistent amount of money so the, the consistency isn't about being consistent in what you earn you know 500 dollars a day doesn't work having high win rates equally as alex said very, very few of our traders have a plus 50% win rate. What this means is that nobody can really have a particularly smooth equity curve. What I'm going to talk about today is the fastest path to actually getting a relatively smooth equity curve, something a little bit more controllable. You know, at the end of the day, what we all want is to watch performance very steadily and very consistently gravitate higher. In reality, that is rarely whatever actually happens. So, how do you get close to that is what I'll be touching on in a little bit. Let me give you a little bit of an explanation of this. And to do that, what I've done is I've actually taken three months worth of performance of a group of traders and then applied a couple of conditions to this. So what you've got there are four different curves and what they show are what happens if you apply a couple of rules to a performance over the course of this period of time this was this was um summer of 2022 i used it was a pretty busy time people did perform reasonably well 
this is what you got over that period. So that's the blue line. So that was for a, you know, a group of about 20 traders. That's the blue line. But if you then apply some conditions to this, and one of them being <clears throat> to have a target on your trading. The idea that many people see is consistency of having a target, you hit that and you go home. Now, if you look at the ones that have a target, the red, which is a target with no stop, i.e. you don't stop yourself out on the downside, but you do have a target, you limit your upside. What it also means, if you don't have a stop, is you actually make your downside more, more, more and more significant. Likewise, though, the green line, yes, it goes up. But what's happening here is you're giving yourself a stop and a target. What I've done is imposed a theoretical daily stop of minus 200,000 and plus 200,000. So what that creates is that situation. It's the second worst performance. One of the key factors in consistency is limiting your downside by virtue of a stop, but also not limiting your upside. Because what you're effectively trying to do there is you're trying to make the upside count for a huge amount. By doing this, you can lose. So you can have a less than 50% win rate. You can lose more days than you win. As long as you make the upside pay, because what the, ups what the big upside gives you is the capacity to lose without having a great deal of impact. If you limit your upside, what you do is you run the risk that your downside then has a far greater impact. You need far more consistency in terms of update, 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 update in order to actually get the results that you want. I've done other statistics on this, which I haven't got for you here, but I will perhaps show these um, next week of how many days within a year equals a trader's performance. So if you took their total performance of the year and then looked at their top 10, 15, 20 days, majority of traders top 10 to 15 days equal their total PL for the year. So what this suggests is that consistency is being able to steadily grow, but at the same time, you're looking for those big upsides, and that's what really allows you to grow. So what we're going to look at today then is, well, how can you become more consistent? And what is it that allows you to tick along, to find skills, to develop skill sets that allows you to grow as a trader? And predominantly what this comes down to is the ability to scalp. When we're looking at consistency, and what I've got here is I've got three different equity curves. One of a swing trader, a macro trader, and a scalper. Swing trading is often very attractive to a lot of people. This is one of the more inconsistent ways of performing because what you're relying on is one or two big up days versus quite a few losing days and being able to sit with losses for quite a long period of time. Psychologically, this is quite tough. You can see here somewhat erratic performance and long periods of not a great deal. Each of these traders over this period all made around about the same amount of money pushing towards half a million. So each trader equal in their performance, but differing in the way that they got there. If you see the day-to-day -day performance, you see that you know, there's quite these sporadic peaks in performance win rate 53 percent. so the swing trade has not got a bad win rate but it's quite you know spaced out where their performance really comes from and actually there's one big trade here a couple of other reasonably big trades and most of the rest of it is reasonably flat if you take someone who's more of a news trader they've actually only got a 39 percent win rate 56 percent loss they are far far more active and we'll have a PL curve that kind of jumps. It will sort of go flat, jump, flat, jump. It sort of steps higher. That's great until you hit a period where we lack news. When you lack news, then we get this sideways type action. So they're consistent in what they're doing, but the performance is contingent upon markets providing opportunities. So one way that you can weather all seasons is if you have the ability to scalp, which is what I'm going to go and show you a little bit of in a moment, then you can get that consistency that people desire. Yes, you get phases where you get a much greater swing up, but then whilst the other traders have stayed very, very flat, 
you're actually still seeing this steady growth beyond that point. Consistent action throughout the month. Yes, he's still taking more losers than winners, which I think is probably counter to what most people think about scalpers. But what scalping allows you to do is it allows you to participate and then get a feel for what the market's doing. And therefore, you can then hold on to that a bit further. Scalping is a skill that benefits any trader. You know, somebody of this type is someone who will trade up and down, up and down, you know, maybe relatively flat on their performance in a range, in an area. But what that gives you is the ability to recognize when a market is now starting to show direction. As it does, you can then stay in the trade. You can leverage the trade up. That's something I'll show you in just a moment. As I say, one of the easiest or quickest ways to become consistent is to understand scalping. You know, from a day trader's perspective, all of us started off as scalpers. Most of us still use this ability to some degree, whether that is scalping as a skill to enhance your entry points. If you can understand the very short term movement, you can get far better, more accurate entry points. You can actually take large swing trades with relatively small downside. Scalping also enables you to understand volatility better, to deal with volatility. When the market gets quick, you can understand where it's slowing down, where it's speeding up, where you're going to be able to participate more. Scalping is a skill on its own. That's the first thing I'll show you here. Scalping is a skill on its own. And then we'll go and look at an S&P one from CPI two days ago and using scalping there to actually then enter, find a low, and then be able to participate in a much larger swing type trade. So any style can be enhanced through scalping. Equally, though, I don't believe there's many people who are who can be complete out and out scalpers without the ability to understand market structure as a whole. So let's get on to it. I'll give you a first example of how you go about scalping. And this is something that happens all the time. I know that it shouldn't happen, but people do consistently try and manipulate markets and flip markets, absorb positions, and then flip the markets over. You will see phases of this happening. Now, this is entirely tradable. If you can understand what's going on, you can still trade this without doing any of the illegal stuff. So let me explain what's going on here. This is a pattern that I'd witnessed over the previous couple of days as well whereby what was going on, and this is the Bund, so German bond market, the market was getting pinned down. So people were trying to sell. But in order to sell, what they were also doing is trying to get other people to buy. So force people to buy into where they want to sell. Now, if you can understand what that what is happening there, you can see that on ladder, you can participate in the sell and then be able to scout part of that position out whilst then playing for the larger move. We'll actually be looking at what happens up here and how you can participate in this bit of the move. So I'll bring this one up for you. Here we go. Right. Starting off, this is up at around about 75. So <clears throat> markets opened, traded a little bit higher, which is what you can see on the profile here. And we're now trading below yesterday's low. People are coming in to attempt to sell 75. And the first thing you can see is a relatively large order here. And this is somebody who keeps on trying to absorb. Now, if you can see this pattern, you can then enter where they are. Because what's been happening is each time the market moves up, they absorb. But also, they're trying to push people to buy into that price. Now, as that happens, you can join that. You can sell with that. But what you also need to do as a scalper, I'm always looking at the market in terms of ranges. So what I mean by this is I've seen it trade up to 75. I've seen it trade back down to around 70. So if I'm scalping this with a downside bias, what I'm trying to do is build position at 75 and then try and reduce it as we get to 70, but always trying to maintain part of the position with the view that once you break 70, this is where then the market can accelerate. But by participating in this, you get a far greater understanding of whether the market actually is going to do what you think it's going to do. So the goal here, get a position, roll it down. You can take some profit. This is what people also call bankrolling a trade. 
The idea here being that by the time we break out of this range, you will have been able to take a few contracts up and down the range for four or five ticks at a time, over and over and over. So if this trade does indeed go wrong, and you get stopped out, let's say at 80, you've already paid for that loss. And this is a great way to be able to build some degree of consistency. If it goes wrong, you paid for most of the loss and you're probably still going to end up with a small positive. If it works, you've paid yourself and now you get paid on the bigger move, essentially down towards the lows of the day, which at the time is going to take you down towards 24 and then beyond. So around about a 50 tick winner. And that's the goal of this type of trade. Each time it rolls up and somebody then starts to absorb it, you join, you add a couple more contracts, you take them out. You keep adding, you keep taking out. And you follow this process whilst the market rotates. But in doing that, what you're also going to be able to see is what it looks like when it breaks. You see here, on the move up, they've started to build those bids up. So they increase the size of the bids. That gets people tempted to buy. And as soon as they then start to get filled at 75, then those bids start to retract and that allows the market to rotate back down. It's a classic spoof into a price. Somebody absorbs this and the market then rolls over. It's the kind of thing, if you've watched these things a few times, you start to pick up this type of rotation. Even if you're not watching the specifics of what's going on, but seeing that rotation where the market gets stuck on both sides is a playable trade. Crucially then, what you're looking for is the change. What happens when it goes to 69 and doesn't rotate back? That's the bit that allows you to then stay in the trade. And that's the bit that you're looking for. Obviously, you could get this wrong. If it trades up through 75, 78, 9, 80, 81, then you'll be improved wrong on this trade. And that's where you're going to have to give it up. That's where you're going to have to say, you know what? I thought it was going down. The sellers have been overwhelmed. Here we go. We see it just drop quite easily through 71, 70, 69. And 69 is now holding on the offer. So what you're seeing here now is rather than the market getting to 69, 70 and bouncing back, it's now sticking lower. If you're short here, this would now be the point in time where you're thinking, yes, the move is on. I can stay in this and I can now look for the continuation all the way down towards 24. Obviously, that takes around about an hour. So I'm not going to show you the steady continuation move down there. But that is essentially what you're trying to do with scalping. You're trying to understand what the market's doing, but in the same time, get paid for it. So that's one example of using the bun. We'll come on to the S&P now. And crucially with the S&P, what we're looking at here is a pre-planned idea and then being able to get into this trade and how you go about entering a trade. So what this is really down to is how do you buy a level that isn't reached? What we're looking at here then, and we discussed this um, with the guys on the, on the course during the day, we discussed this idea of the S&P dropping down to the VPOC. I'll just change that color. Dropping down to this VPOC, so the previous high volume of the previous day. You can see that on your profile here. Now, that was hit on the CPI data, that low. However, come the cash session, we don't reach it. So the question here then is, well, how do you buy a level that isn't reached? And how do you then manage your risk? People talked about risk management. When it comes to consistency, the market only gets down to 80 and a half. The level is 77 and a half. You're paying up three big handles to get into this trade. How do you do this and actually be able to manage your risk on a trade like this? I'll show you what, how you go about doing this and how you can then participate in the much larger move towards the upside. And again, it's about being able to participate, to take those small ranges out of the market and then recognize the change which allows you to then stay in and even add in to the next leg of the move. So I bring it on to a one minute. This is what we're going to be looking at, this bit of action down here. Now, I think for most people, you'd look at three very small one minute candles and think that looks pretty boring. And indeed, from a chart, it is. There's not much to be said for this. The only way that from a chart you'd look at this as a trade is once the delta starts to tick up and we get through these highs. So that's buying it around 91. If you're now buying 
10 handles above the low. So what we're looking at is, well, how do you get in at the low? And I'll show you exactly how you go about doing that. There we go. Right. So what we're going to look at now then is how do we get in down at these lows in the S&P? You've seen the market just trade down towards 80. So this is now mid cash session. And what I'm always watching here, whenever I see a market move lower and then move up, is what's the current range? It's just like the Bund moves up towards 83, moves down towards 81. <clears throat> so I'm not looking for an add on a break of a moving average. On For this trade here, I'd be looking to add on the break of this high. So you've got this recent high around 91. That would be my main area to break. If you can see the absorption down at the bottom, you can participate in this. Yeah, you know, This is something that Bookmap will show up. You can participate in this down towards the lows rather than having to wait. You know, what I don't want to always be doing is waiting for confirmation. If you can get in down here and then recognize the movement away from this zone, you're in. By the time it gets to 91 up here, you're going to be in position and able to then assess whether the market will keep going. If it breaks 91, wonderful, you can stay in. If it fails to break 91, you can exit and still be able to take yourself a decent looking winner up at, say, 89. So what I'm looking for here is where we're rotating back up to. We've seen since I've been talking up to 83, down towards 80, up to 83, down towards 80. So again, a bit like the bun, the goal here is to hold a position fully aware that this can go wrong. You know, I showed a couple of examples. The scalping trader doesn't have a huge win rate. He could get a high win rate by constantly taking these little winners out of a trade, but that's then not going to give him the upside that he's looking for. Yeah, he's still going to take the losers when these do go wrong. So what I'm looking for here is the ability to take a position on the basis of a technical idea and then scalp this position until it becomes clear what's going on. You can buy towards the bottom of this range. You're never going to get a perfect entry on these trades as well. And one of the things, what you don't want to be doing is panicking and jumping out of this trade. You know where this can go wrong if we can get down through 77. Granted, you would want to reduce position before we get there, but you'd then still be able to have another go at buying down at 77 as well. But what we're seeing here is a building up of volume down towards lows, a market that is not willing to rotate up at the moment, but likewise not willing to rotate down. If you see every time we go down towards 80 and a half, 80 and a quarter, we trade down and the market sticks. It slows down down here. So your goal now is you can buy down there with the view that you cover some as you get to 82 and a half and then buy again. But don't drop that core position. If your goal is to be long down here, you don't want to drop that core position away. You want to be in, you want to be holding on here. And so this is what you're then starting to see. Market's up towards 83. Does it break? If you've covered part of the position, you can leave this, wait to see if we can get through 83. And then, as you can see, it starts to hold 83. We can now try and add on higher. So this is then adding back in. Something that I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with as well, whereby they enter a trade, exit at 82 and a half and then add at 83 people don't like doing this but scalping crucially is about participation you've got to keep on participating because by participating you then start to get a sense as to what's really going on now that you're breaking 83 you can actually be relatively confident we shouldn't really be coming back even to a scratch now so you're now in a great position where you can quite comfortably say okay well i'm going to play for the next leg of this move wait for a new area to establish, a new range to establish. And then as you see there, try and join the bid to keep on now playing a directional scalp rather than a multi-directional scalp. <clears throat> Would your core position be larger than your potential ads? Ideally, yeah. Ideally, you want to keep your core position, you know, perhaps say two and then add ones, or you, know, you can extend that out and out and out. What you don't really want to be doing is adding and ramping your average price up by incrementally building your core position or keeping a core and building around that, you keep a lower average price. By this point, we've now surged higher. You now have seen that sort of extra surge up. 
you're now looking once again rotation back where is this coming to 86 and a half may well be the limit of any reversal now and in fact willing to actually this trader to go for it a little bit further push the size up to try and capture the next leg of the move that's how you're looking to scalp this is how you can scalp into a swing position rather than just trying to trade up down up down up down in a range long short long short which is i think what a lot of people think of scalping well instead what you're trying to do is you're trying to actually build a position or bankroll a position to then hold this for that larger move goal being in this case all the way up to around about 09 and 11 up in this area and then there was a further scalp trade onwards from that as well where you could scalp directionally key to scalping then is understanding what it is that you're good at i'll move us on from this point understanding what you're good at not all scalping is the same just nicking ticks that's how it was when i started it was about nicking ticks here and there can i take one tick here two ticks there and just constantly trading scalping's evolved the algos the market makers have taken away that one tick two tick game um, but what scalping can now do is get you into those other types of trades. So as a scalper, what you need to know is what you're best at. Are you a good breakout scalper? Are you a good continuation scalper? Do you prefer to play reversals? What you also want to add, and this is the thing that we try and bring into all of our traders understanding any new traders that we take on, it's not just about this is how to scalp. These are some order flow patterns. It's about how to bring this into a bigger picture how to understand where liquidity really is being formed, how to understand where a market has potential to go. This way, you can decide where you want to play breakouts and continuations and reversals, so you know where you're going to perform best. You equally need to be able to understand volatility levels. Do you perform well during volatility, not during volatility? So scalping is something that, yes, can be used all the time, but you ramp your scalping up when perform when opportunities face you high volatility or low volatility depending upon the type of scalping you you do are you better at trading ranges or trend days by having all of that in place <clears throat> what you're able to then do is you're able to know when the best days are going to be for you when the worst days are going to be for you when you should be more active when you should not be more active but crucially when there is a day that sets up in your favor you should be extremely active. What you're trying to do, ultimately, is smooth your equity curve. Somebody who's going to take lots and lots and lots of trades is somebody who's going to be able to consistently build performance. If you're more spaced out, more sporadic, infrequent in your trading, what you are relying on is big jumps. News traders, swing traders rely on those. They rely on those big outsized up days but also accept that they're going to also have these big outsized down days. Whereas for a scalper, you're rarely going to have one of either. But what you're trying to do is constantly grow by virtue of being consistently active and then being able to spot those ones where the market does then start to run. We'll cover a few of the questions. So I will write these ones down and I'll try and cover those towards the end. So Steve, um, Jean-Francois, hopefully I've pronounced that right. We will get to those questions in due course, but I know Bruce is probably itching to come and join us as well. So I'm going to bring Bruce in in just a moment. The whole reason that we start teaching people how to scalp, how to recognize small order flow patterns is this is the basis of everything. If you can spot small order flow patterns, if you have the tools to do this, first up, you can just trade simple order flow patterns. This then leads into being able to understand that change and directional scalping. Once you've got that, then you can branch this out. You know, Trading is about growing skill sets. If you stay an order flow scalper, eventually that way of doing things evolves. You know, I saw this when I started. I was very much an order flow scalper when I started in 2007, 8 But that gets eroded by algos, by market makers. So then you have to understand directional trading. Volatility also impacts on your ability to scalp in terms of the number of trades you can take. So you need to understand when to be volatility scalping or not. This also leads to some of our best traders to be good at trading news. You know, one of our best traders 
on trading news or you would call best macro traders is actually more of a scalper. He's a scalper, but he uses the news to facilitate high volatility scalping. So to provide the opportunities for him, it's about that understanding of when is the best time for you as a scalper to so understand your own skills. But there you have it. That is what we try and build for a lot of our traders. And the fastest way that they can get consistent is having this ability to be able to scalp and understand short-term order flow. This is something that I know Bruce is going to show us a bit more detail on with Bookmap and the new tool that they have there. So I will bring Bruce in now. Over to you, Bruce. And a reminder, if you do want to join us next week, there is the link. It is also in the chat. So good to see you, Bruce. I will uh, let you take over. In due course. Okay. Okay. We can hear you now, Bruce. All right. And uh, yep, trying to share my screen here. And it says uh, disabled. Okay. I think you will be given host in just a moment. Aha, now you're host. Now you can ah, share. Okay, got it. Go for it. I will get myself out of the way. See you guys in a little bit for the Q&A. Okay, well, thank you, Rich. Thank you, uh, Alex and Craig, uh, for having uh, us over uh, at Bookmap. Uh, and uh, we're going to go through uh, a new uh, tool that we've uh, developed. Uh, it's uh, rather unique and uh, uh, we're and has uh, tremendous flexibility. So uh, we call it Market Pulse. Uh, and uh, I'll go into the details here. So anyway, uh, the orderful applications uh, that we'll, we will go over in some uh, use case scenarios here. Um, the um, uh, but first, I, we're going to go through the uh, introduction to Bookmap. What is Bookmap, and then what is Market Pulse? Uh, before we dive into uh, it deeper here. So, uh, first off, the introduction to Bookmap. So, I'm um, not sure how many people are familiar with Bookmap uh, and what it is exactly. Um, it it basically is. Um, well, it, it very unique visualization of the market uh, from the most binary level of uh, seeing uh, a, a transaction take place uh, and who's taking the other side of that trade uh, to uh, uh, being able to zoom out and see it on much, much higher time frame, both for the current and historical view. Uh, so we have the dome or the depth of market and the liquidity. Uh, we have the price action and we have all of the transactions all within that composite view. Uh, so uh, that's the key. Uh, and uh, both the current and historical. So you don't need to look at three different applications for that. Uh, so here's just a, a screenshot of Bookmap. I do have it open and we can go through the live market as well. Uh, but um, uh, over here, this uh, white line here is a divider uh, between the historical market on the left and the current market on the right. Uh, we have our price ladder here. Our uh, last transaction here, uh, and then the, these columns. We have volume columns. We have many columns that you can put in here. Um, but the COB column stands for current order book. And this is showing you the depth. This is your dome. Uh, there are other many configurations of a dome. Uh, in fact, we do have a dome product as well. Uh, this is a simplified one here showing you liquidity on the offer with a histogram and the numerical values. Uh, and liquidity on the bid uh, as well. So uh, the liquidity is always changing. Uh, these numbers are, are constantly uh, uh, adding and pulling uh, uh, the liquidity. So what we do in Bookmap is we take these numerical values and transform it into a graphical representation in the heat map. Now, the heat map uh, is just... Um, uh, showing you that those areas of high liquidity. So you can see here, uh, this orange uh, area, it's very high liquidity uh, down here as well. Uh, orange or red down in here, 664 contracts at this uh, 5115 level. Uh, so when the liquidity changes in the depth of market in the current market, the uh, heat map will change and reflect that change. So red and orange is very high liquidity, then yellow, white, blue, and then black. All right, so the interesting part here, though, is we record that 
and plot it on the chart. So now you don't have to remember certain areas of what that liquidity, how much liquidity was there, how long was it there, did they add, did they pull, did it transact? It's all here. You can see it documented. Uh, so here on the left-hand side of the chart, uh, we see the uh, uh, price move down into high liquidity here uh, and it transacts and there's still more selling. It was not absorbed uh, and uh, more aggressive selling uh, down to this another uh, next area of high liquidity down here. Now, um, let's just go through these three elements here on this chart uh, very quickly. Uh, I don't want to go into too much depth here, uh, but uh, the volume dots that you're seeing here, uh, these are um, the transactions by the aggressors. Okay, so a green dot is a market buy order. The size of the dot tells you the size that transacted relative to the other dots. Uh, a red dot is a market sell order hitting the bid and taking liquidity off of the best bid. Uh, and the size will show you how much is happening or transacting there as well. All right, so uh, now what's, what's really interesting here uh, in this composite view is to be able to understand this context between high liquidity, price action, uh, and the transactions. Uh, so as price is going down here, uh, you can see it's trading into high liquidity. At a certain point, there's no more sellers or a lack of sellers. And we see a transition, just like what Richard was talking about. And this is the transition that we want insight to and get that comprehension uh, of that liquidity uh, down here. Uh, and then when buyers might start to come in. Uh, and we see that uh, move here to the upside. And where does it target? Well, the swing up here, but there's liquidity up here as well. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, these are the three components, the price action or best bid and offer. There's no aggregation of data in bars. Uh, it is just pure price action. Uh, the transactions with the volume dots uh, and the liquidity heat map showing the other side of the trade or the passive orders. All right. So uh, uh, we can... Um, review a little bit as we go through some uh, examples um, with the market pulse uh, use case scenarios. But what is market pulse? Well, uh, we've developed this uh, unique uh, set of algos uh, that are in a widget form. Uh, and there's various, um, or there are several different algos that we have uh, and different uh, configurations as you, as you can see here. Uh, so, uh, to give an, a very brief overview of what this is, uh, this, this widget uh, indicator system, uh, it's multiple event algos. Uh, one can read volume pressure. Uh, another can read the volume pressure and balance. The other, another can read the um, uh, uh, order book and balance uh, or the price change. Or uh, it's also possible to get multiple indicators uh, based off of API. So if we have a sp specific indicator, uh, it might be uh, um, absorption or sweeps, uh, and we can read and create a market pulse indicator off of another indicator uh, via our API. We call it broadcast API. Uh, you can create synthetic instruments. So uh, not just for one uh, market or one instrument, uh, you can create multiple. Uh, you'll, you'll also be able to create multiple uh, algos within multiple instruments. So you can see where we're going with this. It's extremely flexible uh, and uh, really uh, interesting uh, direction for us here. Uh, and as mentioned uh, earlier, this um, has audio alerts. So you can actually hear the market uh, as uh, it's unfolding. Uh, this is rather unique. Uh, and it does harken back to those days in the pits uh, and gives you a feel of the market uh, via the uh, kind of like pit noise, basically. Uh, this system here or um, uh, indicator system works with future stocks and crypto, and you can make synthetic instruments from any of these as well. All right. So uh, here it is, that same uh, image that we had earlier. Uh, and uh, this is with showing uh, the, the ES here uh, and looking at the uh, volume pressure imbalance widget. Here's the small widget and nothing's happening on it right now, uh, really. But uh, 
Uh, we also have it here in the subchart. Okay, so uh, you can see uh, these little uh, uh, points up in here uh, where uh, we're getting a signal on the buy side. Uh, and then these red points down here, we're getting a signal on the sell side. All right, so I'm going to actually uh, exit the um, uh, slides uh, just for a moment here. Uh, and I want to show you the Market Pulse tool. Uh, and then I'll, I'll show you a few use case scenarios, or we can even uh, potentially get some from the um, uh, live market as well. Uh, so uh, anyway, it's uh, up here. Uh, click on the uh, configure add-ons. Uh, here is our market pulse uh, add-on here. Uh, and then uh, you can see I have two open right now. Uh, one is volume pressure imbalance for the uh, S&P E-mini. Uh, and another one is the same volume pressure imbalance, but for the NASDAQ. Uh, I have a threshold uh, and I also have a volume uh, to hear that sound uh, when it comes in. All right, so uh, the um, uh, let me show you uh, the widgets here, okay, and bring them over. All right, uh, and uh, you can see this these little white lines in here. These are the thresholds. So it starts in the middle here, and you can see some red coming in, uh, negative uh, nine percent. Uh, that's sell volume. Uh, now this is volume pressure in balance in balance, which means buy minus sell. Uh, so uh, uh, when it crosses this 70% threshold in here, then we will hear uh, an audio alert. We will also see it here in the subchart. Uh, this is where it gets rather interesting uh, because uh, you can start to look at the subchart in here uh, and how it relates to the price action uh, and the liquidity. And a lot of times you'll see uh, how it can catch uh, the extremes in here. So let me just zoom out a little bit more. Uh, and you'll see like uh, in the uh, on the move down here, well, we see this, this buying up in here, that was the high. This buying up in here, that was the high. This cluster of buying up in here, again, that was the high. We see the sell off and then uh, we can see the swing low here as well. Okay, so you can match these up really nicely here and back test this uh, just within the current day and see several examples here uh, how you can line up and gain insight from the volume pressure and balance. And this is just one algo of many. Okay, so uh, let me open that up again here and I'll show you. Uh, if I click here and um, uh, we have absorption pressure, absorption pressure and balance, liquidation pressure for the, um, uh, you can maybe hear it now as well on the ES, um, and um, uh, order book pressure. The liquidity pressure or liquidation pressure is for the crypto markets, uh, very unique. Uh, uh, we have the price change, the spread change, sweeps pressure, uh, and volume pressure. Okay, We are adding more as well. All right. And uh, let me just go through just uh, the basics. Why am I getting a sound here and how this works? It is very, very simple. Uh, if I right click on here and go to the settings, there's really only two settings in here. Now the threshold here is at 70%. It's these little white lines. Um, we covered that already. Uh, and, uh, and then also the, the, um, uh, the sound here, the audio alert. Uh, we have the half-life and the training period. Now, all of them are adjustable. Uh, to whatever you prefer. Uh, we have the training period though, and this is important to go over. Uh, what this, the data that this is uh, calculating is a current five minute uh, data period, and that's it. Okay, so it's always a sliding window of current five minutes of data. Uh, and, um, and it's the volume pressure and balance from that uh, buy minus sell over that five minute period. Uh, now, the half-life period, uh, you can see it's here at 10 seconds. What this means uh, is that this will bring it back toward the zero line uh, over time, uh, over 10 seconds. So let's just go through a quick example. Suppose uh, we had uh, 1,000 lots uh, trade in the S&P um, just, just now. Uh, and um, so and let's, let's suppose the output right now for um, the... Um, uh, S and P is is a thousand. If nothing transacts within ten seconds, 
this will now be 500. So it goes back a, a half-life of it. If another 10 seconds passes, it will be 250. All right, so that's how it, it brings it back toward zero uh, over time here. Now, there's constantly buying and selling, uh, and it is constantly uh, coming back toward zero as well. That's how we can gauge some of the extremes in here. All right, so interesting signal or uh, uh, output we're getting right now. Uh, s and is coming right up to this previous swing here, and we're starting to hear it. All right, and we have high liquidity up here as well. All right, so now, uh, based off of that, uh, you know, we have a, a couple of different confluences. Now, we're going to get maybe uh, a, a stop run uh, through up into this high liquidity. Uh, and then we hear the uh, uh, market pulse uh, uh, really, really give us a, a big sound here. Uh, and then uh, and then it fades uh, after that, after some extreme uh, uh, volume that trades uh, that could be a stop run or uh, it could be um, uh, a mass absorption mm -hmm. uh, or uh, you know, a lot of traders uh, jumping in and, and breaking out and, and looking for uh, climbing up toward these other areas of high liquidity here. Anyway, it's a brief overview uh, of the um, uh, functionality of Market Pulse. Uh, now, I wanna go through a couple of use case scenarios in here uh, as well. And uh, let me uh, turn this off for the moment uh, and um, uh, have a couple of videos, one from non-farm and uh, uh, one that was uh, actually during non-farm, but later in the day. So let me show you this example here. And we'll start with that one. Uh, so it was based off of that. Uh, let me close this. Hold on. Uh, it was based off that same image I showed earlier. Uh, and um, uh, what it looks like or um, how we got a signal from Market Pulse. Hold on a minute. All right, here we go. Okay. All right. So uh, we were we were going. Uh, we talked about this liquidity being filled on the way down, uh, and uh, and then again here. Uh, now uh, before we. Uh, and turn this on and, and play it. Uh, what do we have here? So we see this transition starting to take place in the market uh, from a lot of selling uh, into high liquidity to buying starting to come back in. Now we're coming back up to where the market dropped from up here. Uh, and we're seeing some buying right now. Uh, now this could be potentially like a you know a, a, a lot of absorption up in this area up in here, but look at the uh, look at the buying on the overall in the composite view here. There is more selling on the way down. Look at the bars here. These are delta uh, market delta bars and market delta dots as well. Uh, and then uh, look at the buying here on the way back up. There is less buying, right? So we have that context here in the bigger picture. Uh, and uh, then uh, we can see that uh, we had a bit more buying up in here uh, and uh, the market sold off. Uh, so uh, we have this cluster of selling uh, down here and we just come back up again and we don't hear market pulse. We're making a lower high in here as well. Okay, so we're looking for, uh, we have many things aligned here. We're looking for more selling down in here. If we can get more selling down to this area here, we look for the potential break of that area in continuation to the downside. And we're going to listen to the market and let us tell, uh, let it tell us uh, where it might be going. So there's some a barrage of selling that comes in. Right back down to the swing. Okay, a bit of a pullback here. Okay, which would we we would uh, uh, assume that, and then we're looking again for that more selling to come in here and break the swing.
Okay, so that's it. Uh, just a simple example uh, and uh, showing that transition uh, of price uh, and volume uh, at a, a very uh, key level uh, and uh, uh, giving that insight. Uh, now I have another example uh, from non-farm uh, and this is looking at the NQ uh, and this was from last week and just a minute here. Okay. All right, and hold on a minute. You can see uh, 8.30 East Coast time here. Uh, now, before we get into that, let's just take a look and just kind of review what Bookmap is showing us uh, and um, uh, in this scenario here. So this is right before the non-farm. Okay, you can see that uh, it, you know a lot of liquidity in the heat map is starting to dry up, starting to get kind of dark in here. Uh, this is very typical. Uh, people are pulling liquidity. However, uh, there are some players that are remaining in the order book. Uh, they are telling us where they want to sell up here at this um, 18312. Uh, also, you can just see coming in here. So maybe these guys know something uh, down here at 8, 8, 18250. Uh, and then uh, uh, down here at, um, uh, at 2, 225 or so, uh, we see liquidity. Some pulled, but it's still in the book there. Uh, also way up here at uh, around uh, uh, 18,366 or so. Uh, this is what remains in the book in the current market. Okay, And because other liquidity is being pulled, and we know that this is going to be a volatile event, uh, this is where we are looking for price to test. Okay, Now we're going to listen to market pulls uh, and uh, as it comes down into these areas here. There's our 250. They're down to 225. And then nothing. Nothing. Okay, so this is that pullback and what Richard had uh, talked about. And now looking to see if we can come back up to this level or high liquidity up here at 312. And we're talking about a potentially trapped sellers in here uh, and uh, uh, looking for uh, the squeeze here to the upside to other levels of liquidity. So this 312 would be the first target. Uh, and then this uh, 18366 uh, uh, would be the uh, second target here. Okay. Now we can see we uh, market pulls uh, hit its extremes down here. We heard it as well. We have not heard the extreme on the way back up though. Okay, so we're waiting for that capitulation, uh, that stop run, uh, and looking at these other areas of high liquidity on the upside here. Okay, and we're starting to hear it now. Okay, and looking for that continuation and, and uh, that move up into this uh, 66 level up here. And just a few more seconds here. Okay. Anyway, guys, this is a few of the use case scenarios with this new tool. And like I said, this is only one tool. Uh, there are multiple. In fact, uh, if we take a look at the, uh, the uh, I can just, uh, just a minute here. Um, there we go. There's our move up into 66. All right. So um, if we look at the uh, Market Pulse tool here, uh, in the live market, uh, I can create uh, a synthetic instrument here and um, uh, we'll uh, create a new one here uh, and uh, we'll, um, yeah, we'll use volume pressure and balance again here. Uh, now I'm going to click on the instrument. From the instruments here, I can create a synthetic instrument by looking at a couple of stocks or whatever I have open here. I'm actually going to look at two stocks to give me additional insight as a correlation to what might be happening in the NASDAQ. So I'll look at the at Microsoft and Apple uh, together uh, in one uh, synthetic instrument. Uh, and then uh, I'll press play uh, and it will create the, uh, the instrument up here. Okay, this is another uh, use case scenario uh, for looking for your, at your bellwether stocks all in one specific uh, uh, algo or uh, widget uh, to give you that insight. Therefore, you can look at your 
main instrument that you want to trade uh, and then uh, uh, don't have to uh, peel your eyes away at multiple monitors uh, and just wait to hear uh, uh, some of those bellwether stocks. Uh, how are they performing and potentially leading the market? So anyway, guys, a few different um, uh, scenarios to go that we went through. Uh, and uh, from uh, what I understand, Alex has actually some non-farm payroll uh, data and uh, equity curves to go over with you guys. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to him. Great. Thank you so much, Bruce. And thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, and you can almost imagine, you know, that those when there was that transition from the late two uh, from the late 90s, from the like uh, from the pits, uh, our uh, the heritage of our company starts back in 1984 in the pits. Uh, we've uh, we've evolved um, through the different cycles, and when a transition, there was an entire collapse of highly skillful pit traders. That when they were transitioning into electronic market, the the inputs uh, they were so used to, and their inputs were you know uh, uh, you know the visual observation of panic on the floor, uh, the auditory, the sound, uh, the sense, uh, you know, the, the human smell of pain. And uh, those skill sets, all of a sudden, overnight, were no longer necessary. You also had your little uh, camadre of individuals on the floor that you can count on, receiver information. And then all of a sudden, when it when a transition to electronic, there was the birth of an entire new generation of traders. And we actually done a workshop before on all these transitional cycles and the innovation creativity you need to evolve and adapt. And actually Futures was part of that, you know, in 2016 when the London proprietary trading industry was collapsing. And what we did, uh, you know, definitely one of the, the main things was the collaboration sharing culture. But so uh, powerful to, to, to be able to use technology now. And uh, and once you can find those those inputs, as you gain your experience, you know Richard's workshop on the scalping, and what are the what are the painful auditory sounds that you need to hear, and what you're looking at on your profile structure or the uh, 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 certain important zone that you're trying to uh, trade that gives you that input, and then all of a sudden your your muscle memory of sound, because like with anything, is is training your muscle memory, it's training your pattern observational skills. And uh, just hearing the sound at those extreme points are great, but those sounds under certain contexts will be very powerful. And it's a you know exciting tool to uh, to see, but you have to you have to make observations over time and then develop your craft in that. So thank you, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, very much, Bruce, uh, for sharing that. And Bruce was sharing an example now um, of non-farm perils, which I know in our workshop next week uh, uh, on the 21st, and to be corrected, I'll show you uh, the link if you want to sign up for that, you know, an exciting uh, a workshop that we'll be um, hosting uh, that uh, that Richard will be showing some non-farm perils uh, uh, examples and why the e why the S&P has been, a regardless of the data, a buy. And what does that mean? And, and, and how would that potentially transform? How can you uh, how can you sidetrack when that does change? But why has that been in place? And Richard's going to be, uh, be, going to be answering that next week. But if I were to just quickly, uh, so not stop my video, but my share my screen, uh, if I can just uh, become host somehow, uh, uh, just, uh, duh, 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 I think, uh, okay. So I'm going to, I in a moment, just share my screen. Okay, right over here. So, non-farm payrolls, uh, this February 2024, we've been working on our trading floor. And if I had time, if I'm able to uh, get the Zoom onto my phone, if you guys wanted to in the Q&A session, uh, let me take you for a quick little tour in our new Cypress office that we're building on the two trading floors. There might be the one or two traders that are still hovering around. It's uh, almost uh top of state in the evening over here or quarter past eight uh, but what i wanted to uh, uh, show you is just uh, two traders uh performance over the most recent nfp and it's in dovetail into richard's workshop next week so you can see this trader actually um uh, in the, this morning's money there's been a lot of bank japan sources happening over the past week on the much anticipated uh march meeting after the wage uh, numbers that come out tomorrow so that's some pnl that he made this is all london time in the morning and then in london we get the non-farm payrolls comes out uh at 1 30. and so most of the pnl that was had over here was in the zf the five-year treasury 
uh, the buns and the bobbles. Okay, I see he doubled a little bit in uh, Bitcoin uh, that day. But the majority of the trading over here, he's more heavy um, on the you know on the bond side uh, and and trading. But all of them had a very similar uh, reaction. That's what Richard's going to be going through and actually some live uh, DOM examples and how he prepared uh, the traders on our six week career program. So this is kind of from a senior trader who has you know over ten years experience in the market. This is one of our junior traders on the uh, Cyprus uh, on the Cyprus desk, and uh, he actually had a tactical play in the German uh, in the German bonds uh, at um, uh, when when the non-farm payrolls uh, was released. But a lot of it was uh, you know thought out, methodically preparing, planning. Even though the data, the inflation numbers were a beat. We had this bid across the equity markets. And so how were these traders able to anticipate? But more importantly, once they started buying, what is it that they needed to see on the order book? What is it that they needed to, to go? And the acquiring of these skill sets, you know, Richard just uh, drew that incredible, beautiful curve of, you know, almost graduating through your skill zones over time. You know, and kind of starting on the scalping before you you start picking up these these higher uh, 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 the, 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 these higher levels of edge. You're not going to uh, be you know operating you know uh, open heart surgery until you've done a few you know you completed your medical degree and uh, you work on. It. It's the same with trading. You know, traders who feel that they come into this industry they can make money you know you know you know overnight is is almost. Uh, a disregard for the skill sets that are required. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, it's almost like a prelude uh, into next week's uh, workshop. And, you know, it's it's effectively the Sculping Masterclass, www.elitetraderworkshop.com forward slash uh, S&P 500. And uh, you're going to learn a lot of how we tactically uh, attack data points. You know, and and and, and from that perspective, um, a lot of, I know, kind of retail brokerages uh, for many years, whether it's central banks or data points, they're up the, uh, they're up the margin, uh, the risk is exposed. And I can understand why they do that. But there are, you know, uh, there are risk mitigation strategies, asymmetrical plays that you can engage with. But it needs the practice. It needs kind of uh, the collaboration and the training from, uh, from, from, uh, from a, a group that... Uh, uh, that constantly engage in this type of activity and scalping. So that's it from uh, me. Thank you again, Bruce. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, we're up and open for Q&A session. Just let me know in the chat if you would like to have a little tour, if it's possible, if I'm able to convert it onto my phone and, and, uh, and, and walk around. So just let me know, but we will open to questions. And uh, yeah, uh, Craig, do you, wanna, do you want to moderate it? Yeah, I can. I've got the Q and A area open. If you want to pop any questions into the actual Zoom Q and A box area, uh, as opposed to dropping them into the chat, then I'll be able to just call them out. Um, and then, okay, so the, I think the the main question I've seen a few people ask is, are we going to get a recording of today's event? So yes, I uh, will make sure a recording gets sent out to you if. Uh, you, know, you want to review the content that's been uh, shared so far. Um, yeah, Khalid, uh, the, yeah, that should answer your question too in, in the chat. Um, not seeing any technical questions. Um, there was a question from Steve about, is there a way to overlay ES, um, what about option strikes and call and put contract volume? I think that may be a question for Bruce. Um, Okay, then we are seeing some other questions coming into the Q and A box. Uh, what was the six week program that was mentioned? Um, Rich, do you want to just tell Nick, who's asked asked that question, what the six week program is? Yep. So we run a six week program. The next one will be in May. So we're looking towards the end of May for the next one. The nineteenth, I believe, um, is the date on that one. Um, we run a six week trading program um, with the view that some of those traders will then be able to graduate to taking positions on desk, uh, um, trading from home if they if they want to trade from home. Um, you know, it's it's where we develop a lot of our talent. You know, we don't bring traders into the firm without making sure that they've got a solid 
base of training. Unfortunately, there's not many prop, prop firms anymore that do actually train people with the view of actually taking them on. So we, you know, we're trying to sort of do for something different, which you know, essentially allows the trading arm of the firm to grow and to sustain over time. You know, one of the things that we're very, very aware of is traders retire. Yeah, if you've had a pretty good career for the last 20 years of trading, you're probably thinking, well, I could go and retire. I could go and open a shop doing something. People do. They move on. So we need to constantly develop new traders. Also, new traders from a trading from a firm's perspective bring new perspectives. They bring new ways of going about doing things. It's really refreshing to see. But the idea there is it's six weeks to bring traders through every aspect of what you need to know from technicals profile order flow book print book map um macro stuff how do you actually plan trades develop new strategies how do you debrief how do you effectively learn what we don't want this to be is prescriptive and a kind of do this do this and you'll be successful we want people to learn their own style understand what they do well you know, are you a scalper are you a news trader are you a swing trader and bring those people through so that's the idea of the six weeks. Um, it's something that we've put together over you know, numerous years. It's come from my own experience. It's come from the experience of the other traders as well. It's been coming from Alex's experience of how do we actually develop a trader that can go ahead into the world of live trading and ideally make a success of it. So that's the idea behind it. Well, there's, uh, there's a question for Bruce here. Do you prefer the volume algo over the price change algo in the market pulse widgets? Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, it's um, it, I we really have a lot of traders that like the uh, uh, volume pressure. Uh, however, um, the price change is excellent as well. Uh, we find that uh, it works extremely well together with you can have both algos open at the same time. Uh, it works really well together because you can look at kind of an ATR type of strategy with the price change when it starts to sound off and you also hear maybe uh, extreme volume uh, into liquidity, uh, you can, uh, it, you know, uh, gain a lot of insight uh, from those those moves. So uh, I just showed the price um, uh, or the volume pressure uh, because uh, for some simplicity sake. Um, and there's a question, a follow-up question from Nick. Uh, can we give more information about the program, signing up, et cetera? Um, I'd say just to, if you immediately want to get some more information, you can go to the Axie Futures website, go to our trader training area, and you'll be able to read a bit more information about the actual program. Um, and I think in the upcoming session, we may share a little bit of extra information about the program. So... That I think addresses that for you, Nick. Um, SL, I'm living in Asia country, and the, and the delay to the feed is always more than 250 milliseconds. What is the impact for people like me to do scalping with slight delayed market data feed? Um, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, I hit. think it's less of an issue than it was. Um, take this back 10 years, scalping with any even slight delay was a massive issue because you were trying to take those little ticks here, there because scalping nowadays has shifted away from this. I actually think it's less um, of a negative. I don't think it's ideal. Don't get me wrong. If you could have less delay, you would always want that. But because scalping is now more about trading a small range, being able to trade from you know, a lot of what I call scalping nowadays is point to point. You are buying this level to go to this level. So I actually think it doesn't have quite such a negative impact. Um, as I say, you'd always want it faster, but there are ways to get around. This is more kind of what I call some short term technical scalping um, that you can do. So it is viable, but you're perhaps missing out on some of the elements. Richard, we, we we have one of our elite eight-figure traders, uh, a, a trader who's been trading out New Zealand. I mean, he's back uh, in Europe, so I, but but he, he he was in New Zealand. We used to joke that he used to, and you know, he uh, in on the South Island of New Zealand for almost two years, making 
very good day. He's very big. You know, he's a, a more of a profile trader, but he's looking to understand the order book. And he used to say, yeah, sometimes I have to send my pigeon across to get the message, uh, you know, uh, for the full. Uh, but he was able to have a career, obviously a more refined skill set that he had developed, but he was able to participate on the order book uh, with, uh, with yeah, with uh, I would say between 200 to 350 millisecond latency. So it can be done, but uh, you're, you're, you know, and I've always, I've always said, you know, I say with our junior traders here on the, you know, on the desk, um, sometimes when you're constrained, you become more creative and therefore you find a new way of how you have to exploit with the, with the, uh, with the environment that you provided, you know, with constraints. Uh, there's two questions from Cool Beans. Um, I guess that's yeah, how, how many traders utilize the book map at Axia. Um, and um, those Axia fund traders that only train physically at the location. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, yeah. With regards to, yes, your 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 chances are, of being funded by us is uh, significantly higher when you train on one of our premises because it's the physical, but we are, uh, Richard, along with our, 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 uh, one of our pet uh, mentors, is leading the charge uh, of something that we'll be announcing you know, very soon, where we'll have a, a dedicated new funding trial program for our remote traders, uh, that they can be backed remotely, but we'll offer you positions in, uh, in, in one of our desks around the world. We can have a, a, a few desks outside of London, Poland, and, and Cyprus. Uh, so we're evolving that because we know there's all this hidden uh, talent that have geographical constraints. And so we want to be be able to have that virtual presence too. And when we say a virtual uh, prop trading floor, not like those fly by nights, you know, uh, so-called funding trial companies, uh, you know, you know, back them like we back our guys in house. Uh, but uh, that's that is I mean, it's happening now at the moment. But uh, when we go more in mass, it'll be it'll be announced. Um, uh very soon yeah rich i don't know if you anything for you to add on that or uh no i, I think you've probably covered it yeah mm -hmm. it is something that i've been working on um over the past few months along with a couple of the other senior people at Axia to try and develop this so that yeah absolutely it will be a case that we are going to be able to take on people non-physically if you will and then uh, I see two questions, which I think are, they sound like a similar type of question about book maps. So Bruce, uh, these could be directed to you, but first one from SK asking about um, having a error when trying to apply the market pulse and asking if it's, he needs global plus uh, book map. I think he has the global plus book map package and subscription. Um, and then Lewis is asking for book map pricing was shown today. Are you looking at global package and um, are these in indicators included or the most, you know, the, these are most popular ones used. Um, so yeah, just what, what the process is for using market pulse with book map. Okay. So um, it's sold on our book map marketplace uh, as a bundle. Uh, and um uh, it is also, it is included, that bundle is included if uh, uh, you get the MBO bundle uh, of indicators. So we've uh, added a lot more value to the uh, stops and icebergs um, uh, indicator in Trader Map Pro uh, indicator package uh, by including uh, a market pulse. And then um, one from Ricardo is asking, do you think that the market pulse volume pressure indicator could be used? as a momentum confirmation trend following tool when it hits high threshold settings. Um, yeah, do you have experience with that? Um, and yeah, a few more? yeah yes. absolutely. Uh, we've, we've got a handful of guys that uh, have been really um, uh, utilizing uh, Market Pulse uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not just the uh, kind of getting that extreme reading uh, of Market Pulse, it's also uh, covering into those extreme readings. Uh, so uh, uh, once you start to hear uh, the market pulse and you're in a position and it's, it's trading up at an important level, uh, that's when you, you that momentum move is maybe um, uh, time to, you know, um, exit. 
Cool. And I think a final question from James uh, to Richard, just asking about how did the traders trade the PPI report? Um, it seemed to have a impact on the market. Um, yes, I can answer that one. Um, ultimately, and this is, well, it's not good to be able to say, but to give an element of you know, reality, people have not performed particularly well on it today. Um, the part of it came with um, comments from the BOJ, which I think made things um, somewhat messy along with the data. But yeah, on the whole, people have struggled on that one today. There's been no big losses. I think the key bit to go along the point of um, what we were trying to make earlier is the losses that have been experienced today are less than a third of what was made on CPI two days ago. So you, know, you have to be willing to to go for the, some of these events. But the idea there is that, like I was saying earlier, you go for the events on the basis that your upside is here. Yes, you can lose on them, but the downside is far, far smaller. So you're still getting that big upside over the, cum the accumulation of the week, despite the fact that you're yeah, today down as a whole, but nowhere near the extent of the upside on CPI. All right, cool. I think I think that covers about all the questions that have been asked. Uh, just from my side, I've popped into the chat a link to sign up for next week's session, which will be, Richard, you'll be covering uh, just how data points impact the markets as trade list opportunity in the S&P 500 for a buy. So that's what we can look forward to next week. And a big thank you to Alex, uh, Bruce, especially for uh, appearing from Bookmap and giving us insights into the Bookmap tool. And of course, Richard, for giving us such amazing insights into the fastest part of consistency. Um, Alex, if then, uh, Richard, Bruce, if you guys have anything you want to add into the final part here, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I mean, just from my side, thank you. Uh, you know, thanks to the whole team, Bruce, Richard, uh, Craig. Uh, cool beans, I see. Uh, thank you for, for letting us know. We do, uh, at the moment, at the end of our career program, we do uh, have funding trials for our remote traders. So we, we will have to get our team uh, to have a look at um at that uh, section of the website so thank you for for bringing that up and um thank you uh look forward you know uh, excited next week i hope to see all of you at the uh, elite trader workshop.com forward slash s p 500 workshop uh you know uh, uh, masterclass next week uh with uh richard uh he is um responsible for for growing our junior traders who then become senior traders. One of the junior traders that I showed you uh, over here today was on the career program not that long ago. And, uh, and, and so these are uh, the, the uh, caliber of people that, that, that Richard is uh, putting through the door here at Axia from the Axia Futures to our Axia Markets Pro, which is our professional prop trading arm. So any opportunity to sit on a webinar with him, uh, you, you know, if you've got a growth mindset and learning in the futures discretionary market, it's always just a great opportunity to learn. Oh, well, I think I'll, I'll take that as a, a compliment. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, I will be covering um, CPI, how we planned it, why it was a buy and how you go about executing that. So we'll get right into the details of how exactly you do this over data and as alex mentioned earlier how to mitigate risks on data by having a clear plan so we'll cover that we'll look at cpi we'll look at performance uh, i'll explain to you everything that goes on so on that note i will see some of you i hope next thursday see you all then awesome cool thanks guys thanks for attending see you on the other side thank you bye-bye thank yeah. you bruce bye-bye